When I was a small boy, I was brought up almost entirely on Handel, and especially the Handel Festival. I once heard a Bach Gewot at a village concert and asked whether it was right to put such a name on the same program as the great masters. And my aunt told me that Bach was quite a good composer, but of course not so good as Handel, this being the accepted view in those days. And with the strange incuriosity of a child, I left it at that and made no further inquiries until I went to school at 10 years old. There I was taken in hand by the music master, Mr. C.T. West, whose name I shall always hold in reverence. He soon realized that I did not much care for the maiden's prayer or true love. And one day, a momentous day for me, he brought me a Bach album edited by Bertolt Tours. Here indeed was a revelation. Here was something undeniably belonging to no period or style, something for all time. This is where Bach differs from other composers. They, with the exception of a few outstanding Beethoven works, belong to their time. But Bach, though superficially, he may speak the 18th century language, belongs to no school or period. There's a tendency nowadays to put Bach in his place. He is labelled as Baroque, whatever that may mean, and according to the latest orders from Germany, he is to be performed as period music in the precise Pennywig style. This is all part of a movement to play Bach as he wrote it. To do this would be impossible, even if we wanted to. Our violins, are played on quite a different principle, our horns are soft and our trombones are loud. I should like to see Mr. Goosens confronted with one of those gross bagpipe instruments which in Bach's time stood for an oboe. The harpsichord, however it may sound in a small room, and to my mind it is never a pleasant sound, in a large concert room sounds just like the ticking of a sewing machine. We have no longer, thank him, the Baroque style of organ, which we are told with very insufficient evidence was the kind of instrument Bach played upon. By the way, I see there a movement afoot to substitute this bubble and sweet type of instrument for the noble diapason and soft mixtures of our cathedral organs. So we cannot perform Bach exactly as he was played in his time even if we wanted to. And the question is, do we want to? I say emphatically, no. Some music dies with its period. But what is really immortal endures from generation to generation. The interpretation, and with it the means of interpretation, differ with each generation. If the music is ephemeral, it will disappear with any change of fashion. If the music is really alive, it will live on through all the changes and chances of musical thought. A young exquisite once said to me, I don't like Bach because he is so bourgeois. This was of course years ago, while bourgeois was still a term of derision by the aristocracy. And not, a, and not a term of abuse by the left wing. I answered that I suppose that I was myself a bourgeois of the bourgeois and I therefore loved his music. Bach undoubtedly belongs to the great bourgeois section of the community. Therefore he belongs to us all. She says no longer any aristocracy in this country and never has been a proletariat. Those members of choral societies who sing Bach perhaps have not the exquisite literary taste of our high intelligentsia. The pietism of Bach's texts are not an offence to them, even when they are translated into what the Reverend Dr. Troutbeck imagined was English. Well, the members of our choral societies are not literary experts, 
and certain words which shock the esoteric sense of literary exquisite passed by them unnoticed. We English are not literary. We are not artistic, but we are musical. It has been said that the average English parlour contains the soul's awakening framed on the wall, the way of an eagle in the bookshelf, and the St. Matthew Passion on the pianoforte. Therefore, we must introduce Bach to our musical public, not as a museum piece. We must do nothing to give the slightest hint of the scholar or the antiquarian. Does this involve, for example, the substitution of a pianoforte for a harpsichord, the doubling of the oboes with clarinets in loud passages, the occasional substitution of strings for the harpsichord in the realization of Bach's figured bass? Different circumstances require different treatment. How did Bach hear his own cantatas and passions? He had a choir of 16 voices, not very good according to his own account, a very ramshackle orchestra of about the same size, and also a large organ. This is what he heard, and as Sir George Dyson justly says, it is doubtful if he ever heard a decent performance of one of his cantatas. What would he have said if he could have heard the mass or passion sung by 300 voices from Leeds or Huddersfield? Would he not have been thrilled and uplifted? It might not be quite what he expected. He might have said, this is not what I ever hoped to hear, but it realizes and more than realizes what is in my mind. However, with this enormous and splendid choir, what is that witty little orchestra of two oboes and two flutes doing? This, of course, must be altered. I see you have an instrument here called a clarinet. This would be very useful to increase the tone of your oboes, which, to my mind, is very thin, and to steady the occasional bubble of your trumpets. Again, where is your organ? It is essential to fill in the gaps of my orchestra. I see that you have an organ in your hall, but you tell me it can't be used because it's the wrong pitch. Well, you are a funny people. How do you propose to do my confitio or the opening chorus of Einfesterburg without an organ? Of course, you must add something. No, I need not do it myself. Any competent musician who understands my work can do that part of it. Some of your new instruments which I see in the orchestra could be brought into inn to help. Your nimble horns, which are soft, whereas mine were loud. And your trombones, which are loud, whereas mine were soft. You have changed all that. And in order to keep the spirit of my music, you must perforce, perforce, modify the letter. Purists may object that Bach never used trombones and trumpets in the same piece of music. This is true. And for this, wonderful reasons have been couched in the best jargon of aesthetic philosophy. The real reason was discovered by Professor Sanford Terry, namely, that the same performers played both instruments. Nowadays, we have both trumpets and trombones at our disposal. May we not, in the absence of an organ, double our voice fast with trombones, as Bach himself often did. Sir Hugh Allen was hardly an iconoclast, but he doubled the voices with trombones in the last pages of the B minor mass. Doubtless Bach would have done the same if his players had been already occupied mounting up to high D on their trumpets. Can we not apply this principle to Bach's string parts as well? He had a very meagre band of strings, and they were probably all double-handed. That is to say, they could play the violin or the viola equally badly. Now, in some of Bach's arias, notably the Arnus Dei 
of the B minor mass, he wanted all the available strings for that wonderful opening melody. If you look at the score, you will see that the first and second violins play in unison and that the violas are silent. This means, I have no doubt, that he made the violas change to violins for that number, leaving the inner parts to be filled in as best they could on the organ or harpsichord. And I feel equally certain that the continual player filled in a flowing accompaniment on not those nasty detached twangs on the harpsichord which we hear nowadays. In our modern orchestras, we have violins and violas galore. So there is no necessity for the violas to double the violins. Therefore, they sit idle, earning their guineas for nothing. To my mind, it would be justifiable to entrust a said flowing accompaniment to them. When I tried the experiment, Sir Hugh Allen was slightly surprised, but said it sounded very beautiful. Closely connected with the problem of adaptation is the question of words. The purists in this matter can be divided into two classes. Those who say that a performance must be in the original language, that Bach wrote for the German text, and that only the German text may be used, with the result, of course, that hardly any of the performers would be able to pronounce or the audience understand what was being sung. I am speaking, of course, not of an audience of specialists, but of the great mass of people who are now crowding to sing and hear Bach. The other class are those who admit that performances must be in, the, in English, but that the words must be mauled about so that not a single note of Bach's recitative shall be altered. These people evidently have no feeling for the beauty of the authorised version, and they, they, rather than alter one note of Bach's music, will countenance such horrors as one brief hour as given in one of our English translations. In this case, we are indeed conf confronted with a conflict of loyalties. Loyalty to Bach's incomparable music and loyalty to the incomparable beauty of our English authorised version. Of course, when Bach has a definite melodic passage, as in his arias and ariosos, his notes must come first. But in the mere narrative, where his object was to fit notes to the words, so as to make correct exclamation of the text, surely we may alter a note or two, so as to preserve our superb English biblical language. Though of course even here, when Bach has a magnificent expressive phrase for a particular word, we must, perforce, place that word under the note which expresses it. Thus we are obliged to say, go yonder and pray, instead of go and pray yonder, so as the word pray can be under Bach's wonderful musical illustration. This point of view naturally does not occur to the distinguished foreign musicians who come here to conduct Bach. I remember once talking on the subject to a well-known and very able foreign conductor. He was much horrified at the slight alterations in the recitative of the Bach Elgar edition of the Passion. When I pointed out to him that they were made so as to preserve the text of the authorised version, which we all love in England, he replied with scorn, I should like to know who authorised it. And when I objected that Troutbeck's literary style left much to be desired, he only said that he believed he was a very religious man. Did Bach always mean his orchestral directions to be carried out to the letter? For example, he scarcely ever specified what instrument is to play the continuo. I have heard the Stay from the B minor mass accompanied by what Mr. Bayard expressively called props on the harpsichord and a full quota of double basses grunting out the bass. Again, when Bach writes an obbligato and marks it oboe col violini, 
Does he really mean the doubling to go on all the time? May we not suppose at the rehearsal he told the oboe to rest for a certain number of bars? Indeed, if the oboist tried to play the whole time, he would probably burst. And occasionally tell the violins to be silent and let the oboe be heard alone. I have tried this experiment with, I hope, success in the instrumental interlude of Jesu Joy of Man's Desiring. Now we must tackle the problem of what is rather pompously called realization of the continuo. In many of the arias and in the whole of the evangelist recitative, all that Bach provided was the bass and the necessary figures to indicate what harmonies should be played above the bass. A figured bass, by the way, is something like the scheme which has been adopted for notation of the music of the ukulele in modern times. This continuo part was given to the keyboard player whose duty it was to improvise a full accompaniment according to the indication in the figures. It cannot be made too clear that what we find in the usual pianoforte scores of the Bach recitatives is not what Bach wrote. As I have already said, what Bach wrote for his recitatives was only the base with the necessary figures to indicate the harmonies. In the usual vocal scores of the Passion, this bass is realized as a series of detached chords placed in the dullest part of the instrument and with hardly any variation of treatment, which makes the cadences, particularly, almost intolerable. However, I hope and believe that these pretty pianoforte parts are never played, and in justice to the arranger, I think they were never meant to be played. Perhaps, really, it would have been better, in that case, to print simply bark space and figures, and not give simple-minded people the idea that, what, that when they play these dreary chords, they are playing Bach. How then are we to play the Bach's recitatives? Well, we have some evidence that Bach and the pupils under his guidance did something interesting and elaborate by way of realization. Will it be impertinent if we also try to do something interesting and elaborate? All is, of course, keeping well within Bach's idiom. In this way, I believe, we should truly interpret the word continuo by a flowing melodic outline, varying according to the nature of the narrative and the emotional content of the words. The letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. If we adhere meticulously and mechanically to the letter of Bach, we shall inevitably kill the spirit. Bach's hearers were 18th century German Lutherans, with minds very different to ours. They had, for example, a very personal reaction to theology. They soon saw no harm in singing Mein Jesu Gute Nacht. Our purists would have us sing My Jesus Now Good Night. But we quite rightly realize that in English this would be mere affectation. Again, these 18th century German burghers liked full value for their money, and they thought nothing of sitting in church listening to, or possibly sleeping through, three and a half hours music plus a sermon. But we, with our quicker apprehension, are more easily exhausted and cannot really endure the emotion of this music for so long. It is the fashion nowadays to perform Bach's passion in its entirety, with a Bach luncheon party between the parts. I believe this to be a mistake. We must admit that Homer occasionally nods, and that some of the arias are not up to Bach's high standard. It is, I believe, wrong to include these for the sake of a mechanical completeness. It is not impossible that Bach never meant them all to be played on the same occasion, but that he made a different selection from year to year. I admit there is no evidence for this, but all the same, it seems not impossible. Why should we perform Bach with all the disabilities under which he suffered any more than we perform Shakespeare in the Elizabethan pronunciation. 
If by modifying the letter we kill the spirit of Bach, then he had better remain dead and be put in the museum with the other mummies. But to all the changes and chances, his eternal beauty shall not fade, because his music appeals to everyone, not only to the East Seat, the musicologist, or the propagandist, but above all, to Whitman's divine average, that great middle class for whom nearly all that is worthwhile in religion, painting, poetry, and music has sprung. Let me finish with one short story. The other day, a messenger boy came to the door with a COD parcel. When I had paid the cash, signed along the dotted line, and received his official thank you, he hesitated for a moment, and then added, When's the passion?